For the benefit of our online guests and listeners who are non-Kenyans listening other places, I say good evening everyone to my beloved Kenyan community, Habari Zagioni. Amen, amen. Thank God for you that you've come out this evening. Allow me before I get into my message to acknowledge the presence of one of the very notable preachers and theologians in the Seventh-day Adventist Church who is presently the professor of missiology at Adventist University of Africa. Along with him is his beloved wife. Dr. and Mrs. Papa, would you stand where you are? Come on, give them a hearty amen. amen. Dr. Papu is a friend of Kenya. He's been here many, many times at Lavington and other places. And presently, he is at our university and teaching in the area of missiology. Sister Papu has a special ministry, and it's very personal to me. My wife has been sick since February. She had COVID last year, January and did not know that parts of her internal system was affected. And to this day, she is still very ill. And Mrs. Papu pulled together shepherdesses from all over Africa and other parts in America praying for her. And God has ministered through the ministry of this shepherdess. I want to thank you, Sister Papu. My wife would have loved to have been here, but she cannot fly because of the, of the challenges that she faces as a result of our illness. And we thank you for coming this evening. Um, I'd like us to, you know, whenever I speak, and I need to get a, a little additive. You know, when your car, when your car is not running so well, you put an additive. And my musical additive tonight is Jesus Savior, Pilot Me. It's one of the popular hymns that we sing in South Africa. And I ask you to come up and to give me a push so that as I get into the Word of God. <clears throat> I want you to sing this with us prayerfully. That is song 551, 551, Jesus Savior Pilot Me. Jesus Savior Pilot Me. When I 
Thank you, praise team. This evening, for scriptural consideration, I would like to read again from the Roman epistles, the epistles to the church at Rome, and read in your hearing verses 1 to 7. Here's what it says. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him bringing glory to his name and you are included among those Gentiles who've been called to belong to Jesus Christ I'm writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and who are called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I've given title to what I hope for the next little while to talk on this subject called to be saved called to be saints. But before I talk with you, let us talk with God. Father in heaven, there is nothing that flesh can reveal unto flesh unless, Lord, you are in the mix. So I ask you to guide this ship. And I pray that your Holy Spirit may assist us on this journey. In Jesus' name, amen. My brothers and sisters, this is a teaching sermon. And I'm asking the deacons if you can get those on the outside to kind of, I'm being distracted. I need the full attention. If the deacons and deaconesses can, those on the outside who are giving us a little competition. Thank you. My brothers and sisters in this encampment, there's no question in my mind that the book of Romans stands at the core and center of New Testament thought. There can be no controversies or debate that Paul's writings to the church situated at Rome have become over nearly two centuries of time the bedrock of Christian doctrine and the starting point for any and every understanding of Christian theology. It is nearly true that one, any person who fails to understand the book of Romans, as difficult it may appear, will assuredly fail to understand the whole Bible. I'll say that again. It is nearly true that one who failed to understand the book of Romans will assuredly fail to understand 
the whole of the Bible. One writer has suggested that it is as if in this letter Paul were writing his theological last will and testament. Look closely here. For Paul distills into these few pages and sentences the very essence of his faith and belief. For here in the book of Romans, the great watchwords of our faith as Christians are examined and defined. Here in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul writes with awesome detail of his own understanding of the righteousness of God. Here, Paul stands on the priestly and prophetic tradition to deal with such subjects as with Jews and Greeks, the wise and the unwise. Paul deals with such weighty matters such as sin and salvation, sanctification and justification, and he further defines, hear me church, hear me encampment, encampment. He defines what it is and means to be a church. And the importance and priority of preaching within the church. It is here in this book that Paul the preacher looks back within the chasm of history and he picks up a favorite phrase of Habakkuk's prophetic notebook. And then he pins the whole of Christianity upon it when he declares, quoting Habakkuk, the just shall do what? The just shall do what? Live by faith. This is the reason then that I've prepared for this encampment and I wanted to examine Paul's writing to the church at Rome. And you're my guinea pigs. I've not yet preached this at Santon. It is simply because there's no question in my mind, no question in my mind, Dr. Papu, that the book of Romans stands at the core and the center of New Testament thought. Any reader of Paul's writing ought to be reminded that what we have here was not how can I put this without being misunderstood? Was not intended or designed for common consumption or universal exposure. Paul did not write to us, even though of necessity he did write for us. I'll say that again. The reader of Paul's writing ought to be reminded that what we have here was not intended or designed for common consumption or universal exposure. Paul did not write to us. Even though of necessity, he did write for us. Paul did not write for the 21st century in which we live. He simply wrote to the church in the first century. Paul did not write to a highly organized church like New Life, or to a sophisticated urban organization that you are, but he wrote to little huddles of persons, outcasts within the enclaves of the Jewish community, who did not worship in grand cathedrals, but in churches that started in someone's house. Are we together? Paul wrote to these little bands of believers who were struggling to make sense of a savior who was slaughtered on Calvary and who was trying, this group was trying to live by the principles of a barefoot Galilean who some say were resurrected on Sunday morning. Make no mistake about it. Nairobi, Paul did not write to us. He wrote to them. 
But we simply tonight have the opportunity to look over the shoulder of history, as it were, and read a letter written to a specific people in a specific time by a specific preacher. Paul's letter bore the stamp of 58 AD and the return address of the ancient city of Corinth. I'll make that plain. Paul's desire was to deliver the letter himself. But before he could go to Spain and get to Rome, for which he had longed and desired, he had to return to Jerusalem with a love offering that had been gathered for those in need, as 2 Corinthians chapter 8 tells us. Surprisingly, my brothers and sisters, Paul's letter was not delivered by traveling companions, no, not by Timothy or, Timothy or Luke, not by Barnabas or John Mark. Paul's letter, hear me tonight, was entrusted into the hands of a deacon, a female deacon. By the way, there is no word as deaconess in the Greek. Hello, somebody. It's an addition to scripture. There were male deacons in the New Testament, and there were female deacons in the New Testament. And the, the, the word in the Greek is diaconate, the noun word. Diaconate, not D-E-A, D-I-A-C-O-N-A-T-E. -E. So this book, help me, help me tonight, was entrusted into the hands, for your benefit, of a deaconess named Phoebe, by name. Paul's letter was penned by his own hand to all that be in Rome. Beloved of God, called of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me confess to you tonight that I'm aware that, that, that one does not usually seek to preach from these few rather uninterestingly, seemingly casual comments which serve as a prologue to Paul's writing. Paul has weightier matters with which to deal in the body of this text. But we must be sure that we observe the defined relationship between the writer and the reader and that we note at the very outset that Paul is about the business of defining who and what he is. After all, he's sending this letter by a female deacon. And he wanted the people to understand not the messenger, but the message. And so Paul begins by Paul's definition of Paul. In the first instance, says the writer, I am Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. More precisely, according to the Greek, I am Paul, a doulos. That's the Greek word for servant or slave. I'm Paul a slave, one whose will is consumed in Jesus. I'm Paul a slave, one who has a permanent relationship of servitude to the Savior. If you want to know who I am, Paul says, or what I am, I'm a servant, I'm a slave. In the second instance, Paul defines himself by saying, not only am I a servant, not only am I a slave, but I am, a I am also called to be an apostle. Are we together? Talk to me. In other words, there's no question, there's no ecclesiastical identity crisis here. There's no confusion in my mind regarding the nature of my calling, Paul says. And parenthetically, by the way, I must tell you, Paul says, that there is something wrong with a preacher or a church elder, a deaconess, or an officer who is not sure of the authenticity of his or her call. Called a divine summons. Called a divine impairment. Called an anointment as well as an appointment. Paul says, I'm a servant. Called to be an apostle. 
And in the third instance, Paul says, I am a servant. Yes, I am called. Yes, I'm an apostle. But more than that, I am separated unto the gospel of God. In other words, he says, there is something different about me. There's something strange about this preacher. There's something peculiar about this preacher. He says, I am separated. I'm set apart from the world. I'm disassociated from the culture. Hello. He says, I'm set apart from the world. I am disassociated from the culture. In other words, I don't behave like the people on the outside. I'm withdrawn from the wicked. I'm I am now distinguished from the demonic. I am separated. My life, Paul says, has a new focus. My life has... He's defining Christianity. You hear me, church? He says, my life has a new focus. My life has a new direction. My purpose is not about bad news. I am about the good news. I'm separated unto the gospel of God. Somebody need to say amen. Paul takes the moment, church, not only to, defi to define who he is, but to define who we are and to whom he is writing. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Oh, Nairobi, new life. Paul's making a definition of us. There's something singularly peculiar to the fact that Paul is writing to the residents of a city to which he has never been. The Roman church is the one church to which Paul writes that he did not found and whose members, with a few exceptions, he had never met. Paul does not know them and knows very little about them. Yes, he, 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 he visited Ephesus and Thessalonica and Colossia and some of the others, but he did not go to Rome. But at the same time, he writes to all that be in Rome, and the implication tonight, my brothers and sisters, is clear. The gospel speaks to our need even if the preacher neglects to call us by name. Somebody ought to say amen. Yes, Paul did not know who they were individually. But he did know what they were experiencing. They to all that be in Rome. Let's localize that. To all that just went through a terrible political situation. Paul is saying to us tonight, you are citizens to the Romans of the capital of the world. Everyone knows all roads lead to Rome. You are citizens of a society ruled by a man named Nero, the son of Agrippina and the adopted child of Claudius. You are fortunate subjects of a madman named Nero. Nero, a man who declared it is not lawful for Christians to exist. Nero, a man who not only persecuted Christians, but who crucified them and then lit, lit them with fire as human torches along the streets and byways of Rome. And here Paul writes to all that be in Rome, I do not know your names individually. I've never been to your homes. He says, I've never been in your worship, nor preaching your prayer meetings in your homes. But I write to you all because I know that you are seat, living at the seat of imperial power. I know that you are at the command post of everything which moves against the name of Christ. I know that you live in a land where the state has declared that the church will crumble and deacons will die and sinners will be silenced and preachers will perish. I know that all for the cause of Christ, you are living in the dungeons of death and the catacombs of human corpses. I know that all for the the cause of Christ, who are marching like Christian soldiers, as your theme song says, on your way to the dusty death in the Roman Colosseum. But, Paul says, I am still writing to all that be in Rome. Now, Paul is insisting here in addressing those residents at Rome in the assurance that we affirm that the gospel knows 
about the role in which we are living. I'm talking about us. The gospel knows about the role in which you and I are living. And tonight, the relevance of the gospel is that it addresses our condition. The realm of hunger for some and weight watchers for others. The realm of children sleeping on the streets and killing other children. The realm of young girls being raped by cruel and godless men. The realm, the realm where corruption is rife and shady deals and businesses are common. The realm of heartless drug dealers and slick sugar daddies who prey on, un on ambitious but foolish young ladies who are in search of a better life, which ineluctably turn out to be a bitter life. Hear me tonight, church. The gospel has your address and my address. Somebody ought to say amen. I said somebody ought to say amen. The gospel has your address and my address. And the gospel is acquainted with where and under what conditions we live and continually exist. The gospel speaks to those who are counted among the principalities and powers. I'm talking about those who sit in high governmental authority and those who do not want the church to survive. No politician, no president, prime minister, king can, de church, can destroy the church of Christ. Are you listening to me, church? The gospel, the good news, is possessed of a sensitivity to pain and poverty, to sickness and sadness, to destruction, disease, and death. You know, there's something, church, I get excited, that, that something marvelous about the gospel. It doesn't have my name on it, and at the same time, my name is written all over it. There's something about the gospel that has your name on it. And there's something that has your name written all over it. You're all quiet. Are we in Europe tonight? Come on, somebody and say amen. amen. Yes, there, there's something about the gospel. It comes every hair on our heads. It, it, it knows when we dash our feet against a stone, there's something about the gospel. It feeds us and the gospel clothes us and cleanses us. And every once in a while, the gospel, the, the, the God, which in a while God grabs hold of a gospel preacher and provides a clear-cut liberating gospel. And sometimes God writes it down in a gospel letter and he sends you word that no matter what your heavy burden may be, God knows how much you can bear. I said every once in a while, God grab hold of a gospel preacher and provide a good news message so that even though he's preaching to thousands away, somebody in the, sir, in the congregation may say, though he's preaching to somebody else, that sermon was just for me. Every once in a while, God sends a word with your name on it. And it's not just for you. It's really to all that be in Rome, beloved of God. Examine the text again. And beloved, you will discover that Paul sent this letter to all that be in Rome, beloved of God. What a word for those who were the outcast of the social order. To know that they were the beloved of God. What a word! Although ostracized by fellow Jews of their own rank and station, they are called beloved of God. Have you ever pondered, I'm talking to you now, new life. Have you ever pondered, have you ever stopped to think what it was that sustained those early Christians of the early church? Hear me. They had no money. They had no social standing. They had no political power. They had no large numbers following their ranks. The only thing they had to sustain them, the only thing they had to give them hope was an abiding confidence in the abiding, abundant love of God. And like it or not, that's all we've got as Christians. 
Some of us really don't have any money, at least I don't, because they don't pay pre preachers too much. Amen? <laughs> we don't have no social standing or status. We don't have political power. I'm talking about Christians. We don't have anything to put our name on the front page of the newspaper, but we are the beloved of God, called to be saints. But all this is nothing really new. You see, these lines over which we have come are but standard fare in all of Paul's letters, quite so. But the thing which disturbed me as I studied this text and disturbs me, it disturbed me and dis still disturbs me, still is, that Paul sent his letter to those who were called to be what? Saints. Talk to me. Who are called to be what? Saints. And you know what my problem is? I know that I'm a citizen of a contemporary Rome called America. And so Paul's Rome includes me. But what disturbs me is this, this being called to be a saint. Consequently, I'm not so sure this letter has my name in it. For every child of God has been called. What Paul may be saying is that just as he has been acknowledged, just as he has been called, every child of God has been called. And even though the preacher must be called in order to minister and do ministry as well, the call is the sign and symbol of God's benediction upon the ministry as well as the assurance of God's blessing on that ministry. Consequently, if there is no benediction, then there is no blessing. I said, whatever God has called you to do in church, God blesses. Yes, he blesses. And the importance is, is what you call yourself. And again, Paul may be suggesting here that who you are, your own sense of self-identity is often revealed by what you call yourself. The name you call yourself is indicative not only of self-perception, but of personal value and worth. It is one thing to call yourself a teacher, but you go to another level when you call yourself an educator. I mean, making myself clear? It's one thing if you call yourself a cook, but you go to another level when you call yourself a caterer or a chef. Somebody ought to say amen. It's one thing to call yourself a banker, but you go to another level when you call yourself a financier. You are what you think you are. You are what you perceive yourself to be. You are becoming what you are in the moment you speak the words which identify how you are to be called. And what Paul is saying here, that even though you are in Rome, the Nairobi, the Rome of Nairobi, you are still the beloved of God. Come on and say amen. But you're also called to be somebody. You're called to be what? Why are you whispering? You're called to be what? Saints. Now let me give you the definition of a saint, and then I'll sit down. Saint, saint, I'm a little more worried about this same business. <laughs> Does this mean that if I'm a saint, that I have to be free from sin? Does this mean that if I'm a saint, that I must be holier than thou? Does this mean that if I'm a saint, I must, make, I must wear my own personalized halo? The answer to these questions is an absolute no. Here's what a saint is. A saint is one who's being made holy by the presence of the Holy Spirit in his or her life. I'll say it again because this side here said amen, but you didn't say anything. I'll say it again. Let me turn to look at you. I said, a saint means is one who's made holy 
by the presence of the Holy Spirit in, in your life. A saint is one who's been made holy by the pervasive power and influence of Jesus Christ on our characters and our conduct. You can't be a thief, a tied thief, and call yourself a saint. You can't be an adulterer and call yourself a saint. You can't be a gossiper and call yourself a saint. A saint is one whose character and life is covered by the influence and power of Jesus Christ. The result is, if Jesus has claimed your life, you are a saint. A part of a holy nation. A part of the royal priesthood. A part of a peculiar people. Counted among the elect of God. It's not just a description of what you do. It's a name by which you are known and called. And I declare to you tonight, let's listen to me everybody. Declare to you tonight, you are a saint. You are saints. You, and you never thought yourself as a saint. But I must tell you tonight that you cannot be in Christ and not be a saint. Not only that, you cannot be in the church and not be in the company of the saints. And the Apostle Paul writes it over and over again. First Corinthians says that we must take our internal church problems to... We must... run. No, 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 no. Let me put it this way. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that we must not take our internal church problems to the courts. We must take them before the saints. It's quiet. Ephesians says that the work of the church is to edify the body of Christ and to perfect the saints. Ephesians also says that even though when you pray, you must pray with the perseverance and supplication for all the saints. First Thessalonians says that when Jesus comes again, he's coming for all saints. Jude says that we must contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. The scriptures verify tonight that indeed we are saints of God. Some years ago, I cannot help Dr. Papu, but remember hearing one of my saintly forebears dealing with this issue of who is and who is not a saint in my home church. I shall never forget his own private and personal definition of a saint. Would you like to know what it is? Would you like to know? I thought you would. Here's how this old person, this old man in the church who didn't have education, but he had intelligence. Here's, what, here's how he defined a saint. He say, I said a saint is nothing but a sinner who keeps on struggling. Amen. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't make mistakes. But you turn and look at Christ. Hello, somebody. And as we look to Christ, Christ meets our need. And that is why you can look to your right and look to your left. When you come to church and say, good morning, saint. To be a saint is an awful claim and calling. This notion of being saints puts us in some high, mighty, high-class folks. It excites me. It verily means that I can stand tonight on the same footing of St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine and St. Bonaventure and St. Francis of Assisi and St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. John, come on, St. Peter, St. Paul and all the rest. And I, while I researched this matter and how saints get to be saints, I discovered and I hope you don't misunderstand me. I discovered that according to the Holy Catholic Church, there are two criteria for sainthood. Would you like to know what they are? Not because I say Catholic, you can get quiet. Come on now. They say, they say, not Parkinson. They say, there are how many criteria? 
two criteria for sainthood. Number one, you must be eligible for beatification. Now that's just a big word which simply means that you've been blessed. I suppose that means I'm qualified. I have food on my table this morning at LMS. Hello. I'm blessed. I have clothes to put on. Come on with me now. I'm blessed. I was reared by a godly mother and a praying grandmother. I am, say it with me, blessed. Everywhere I turn, there's evidence that I'm blessed. How about you? I have a wife who prays to me every night. I am blessed. Can you count your blessings? Count your blessings, the song says. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. More than this, I discovered a second requirement that the Catholic Church has for sainthood. Would you like to know what it is? They say there must be at least two miracles associated with a person's life. Before a pope could be a pope, he must, have two mir he must experience two miracles. Are there any miracles in your life? Oh, there, that may be miracles of the supernatural, which cannot be explained by scientific method. But they are miracles nonetheless. Perhaps the miracles in your life are like the miracles in mine. Can I tell you my miracles? Can I share them with you? I have seen three children born into this world. I was in the room. That's a miracle. Come on, church. I've gone under a surgeon knife at least four times, and the anesthesiologist had me somewhere between life and death. But I'm here tonight. That's a miracle. I've seen men and women come down the altar all the way with their lives changed. That's a miracle. All you need to do is to look around new life, and the evidence of miracles are there in abundance. You have been blessed. You have had more than one miracle in your life. You are qualified to be a saint. You need not to discount your criterion. I declare to you tonight, you are saints. And somebody in a, in, in a slave plantation put together these words. Oh, when the saints go marching in, Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in the number when the saints go marching in. God bless you. Why don't you sing that one with me? Do you know it? Let's try it. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints. Sing it, church. Oh, oh Lord, Lord, I want, I want to be among the number. Oh, when the saints go marching. One more time. Oh, when the saints. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Lord, I want to be among the number. Oh, when the saints go marching, and when they crown him Lord of all, and when they crown, and when they crown him Lord of all, him Lord of all, and when they crown him Lord of all, oh Lord, I want. To be among the number, oh, when they crown him Lord of all. One more time, when they crown him Lord of all. Oh, when they crown, oh, when they crown him Lord of all, him Lord of all. Oh, when they crown him Lord of all. Do you want to be in that number? Oh, Lord, I want to be among. Oh, when they crown him, Lord of Lord. And so tonight, who's qualified tonight to be a saint? Let me see your hands. 
Let me see your hands, those who are qualified. If you accept Jesus as your Savior and you trust him every day with your life, you've qualified. Pastor Papu, pray a prayer of affirmation for us. Let us, oh. Let us pray together. Our kind and loving Father, I want to thank you, Lord, that you could have this experience of coming together as your people, as your saints. What a title, Lord, to be called saints. There are so many titles in this world, but none come even close to being called saints. And we thank you, Lord, as we experience this wonderful fellowship. We've passed through the terrible scourge of the COVID-19. And today, dear Father, we look back and we can say indeed that you have saved us, you've been with us until this moment, dear Father. We don't know what the future, li li what lies ahead of our future, but Lord, we want to thank you. And as we leave this place, may we live knowing that we are your children. We are the saints, dear Father, in your, in your eyes. It doesn't mean we are holier than anybody, but what it means is that you have made us holy and acceptable in your sight. Seen us saved by grace. We want to thank you, Lord, for the preacher who, dear Father, even as he speaks to us, we know what he has gone through in his family, Lord, watching and praying for his dear wife. And today here he stands preaching mightily because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, please, dear God, pour your Holy Spirit on all of us. As we leave this place, let us all be refreshed by the power from above. And may we go, dear Father, conquering the mountains ahead of us, knowing that we are the saints, we are accepted in the beloved, and that, dear Father, we have a place in the kingdom of heaven. We are your children, we belong. And the devil whispers to us uncertainty and lack of assurance. Where we look at ourselves and doubt, may we look up unto, to, to Jesus and the cross, dear Father, and know that as we do that, we'll find healing and refreshment. Bless us all, dear God. Bring us again for our next appointment, because we have got a word for us. And at the end of this care meeting, if you delay your coming, Lord, may we look back and say nothing can ever um, change us, nothing can ever challenge us, because now we stand on the solid ground of sainthood. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.